Good evening. This is Sleep Chamber, a podcast meant to put you to sleep. I'm Henrik, and you don't have to listen to the words, but you can if you want. I won't ever in this podcast tell you to relax or to visualize meadows or butterflies or anything else. I'm just going to talk and you can use my voice either way you see fit. It is what it is. What happens, happens. And as of right now, There's nothing we can do. It was a warm summer day when Jack and his best friend Andy decided to build a tree house. They had been planning it for weeks ever since they had first seen the perfect tree in Andy's backyard. Now, with all the materials gathered and the help of Andy's older brother, they were finally ready to start building. It took them the whole day to get the tree house built, but it was worth it. They were both exhausted by the time they were done, but they couldn't have been more proud of their accomplishment. They had built the treehouse entirely on their own, and it was perfect. The next day, they invited all of their friends over to check out the treehouse. Everyone was amazed at how well it was built and how much fun it was to play in. Jack and Andy had created the perfect summer hangout spot, and they were both thrilled. The treehouse quickly became the most popular spot in the neighborhood, and everyone wanted to spend time there. Jack and Andy loved having all their friends over, and they spent many happy hours playing in the treehouse together. One summer day, after everyone had gone home, Jack and Andy were sitting in the treehouse, talking and laughing. They were both having a great time when suddenly they heard a loud noise. They looked out the window and saw that a storm was brewing. They knew they had to get down from the treehouse before the storm hit, but they were both scared. They had never been in a storm before, and they didn't know what to do. Finally, Jack gathered up his courage and said, Let's go, Andy, we can do this. Together, they climbed down from the treehouse and made it safely back to Andy's house. They were both relieved to be safe, and they knew that they had faced their fears together. From then on, the treehouse was always a special place for Jack and Andy. It was a place where they could be themselves and where they could always count on each other. They had built something amazing together, and they would always be friends because of it. Jack and Andy have been best friends since kindergarten. They had always been drawn to each other, even though they were so different. Jack was the wild one, always getting into trouble and never afraid to speak his mind. Andy was the more reserved one, preferring to stay in the background and observe. But they shared a love of adventure, and that was what drew them together. They had spent many childhood summers together, 
exploring the woods near their homes and building tree houses. It was their secret hideout, where they would go to escape the world. They would spend hours talking, laughing and planning their futures. As they grew older, they drifted apart. Jack got into drugs and ended up in a bad crowd. Andy went to college and started a family. They lost touch with each other and the treehouse became a distant memory. The one day, out of the blue, Jack showed up at Andy's door. He was clean now and wanted to rebuild the treehouse. Andy was hesitant at first but he couldn't resist the opportunity to relive their childhood memories. So they set to work, rebuilding the tree house from the ground up. It was hard work, but it was also a lot of fun. They reminisced about old times as they worked, and they quickly fell back into their old friendship. The tree house was finished just in time for summer. They invited all of their old friends to come and celebrate its completion. It was a magical night, filled with laughter and memories. As they sat in the tree house, looking out at the stars, they knew that their friendship would last forever. The tree house was built on a sturdy oak tree, and it had been there for years. It was a happy place, full of laughter and good times. But then, one day, the tree house was empty. The tree felt sad and lonely. It missed the sound of children's voices and the feel of their small bodies climbing on its branches. The treehouse was lonely for a long time, until one day, a family moved into the house next door. The children discovered the treehouse and started to play in it again. The tree was happy once more. I was content to watch the children playing and laughing in the treehouse and to feel the warmth of their presence once again. As someone who loves nature, I am always drawn to trees. There is something about their tall, strong presence that makes me feel at peace. I often find myself talking to trees or at least imagining that they are talking to me. It might sound silly, but I truly believe that trees have feelings and emotions. The idea of trees having feelings and emotions is not a new one. In fact, many cultures around the world have long believed that trees are alive and have souls. The ancient Celts, for example, saw trees as the embodiment of the natural world and believed that they had the power to connect us to the spirit world. In many Native American cultures, trees are also seen as sacred beings with great wisdom. There is actually some scientific evidence to support the idea that trees may have emotions. Researchers have found that trees produce chemicals that are similar to those produced by humans when they are happy or stressed. And, like humans, trees can also produce more of these chemicals when they are under threat. So, the next time you are feeling down, take a walk in the woods and talk to the trees. 
I guarantee you will feel better. We all know that trees provide us with oxygen, shade, and beauty. They are essential to our environment and our survival. But did you know that trees also have feelings and emotions? Some people might think that this is crazy, but it's true. Trees are living, breathing beings, just like us. And just like us, they experience a range of emotions, from happiness and love to sadness and anger. Of course, trees can't speak like we do, so they express their emotions in other ways. For example, when a tree is happy, its leaves will be green and its branches will be strong. But when a tree is sad, its leaves will be droopy and its branches will be weak. It's not just the physical appearance of trees that changes when they're feeling emotions. Their chemical makeup also changes. For instance, when a tree is stressed, it will produce more of the stress hormone cortisol. So, how do we know that trees have emotions? Well, scientists have been studying tree emotions for many years, and they have found that trees react to both positive and negative stimuli in the same way that we do. For example, when scientists play music for trees, the trees will sway back and forth in time with the music. And when scientists give trees a gentle hug, the trees will respond by producing more of the hormone oxytocin, which is known as the love hormone. Oxytocin is a hormone that is produced in the brain and released into the bloodstream. It is best known for its role in social bonding and attachment. Oxytocin is sometimes referred to as the love hormone because it is involved in the bonding between mothers and their newborn babies and between couples. Oxytocin is produced by the hypothalamus and it is thought to be released in response to different types of stimulus such as social interaction and hugging. Once released, it travels to the pituitary gland where it is thought to influence the release of other hormones, such as prolactin and vasopressin. The exact role of oxytocin in the brain is not fully understood, but it is thought to be involved in a variety of social and emotional processes, such as social bonding and attachment, anxiety, Depression, fear, trust, parenting. Have I told you about Johnny? Johnny was always a bit of a science nerd. He loved learning about the inner workings of the human body and the various hormones that controlled it. So, when he heard about oxytocin, he was intrigued. Oxytocin is often called the love hormone because it is released during social interactions, like hugging and kissing. It is also released during childbirth and breastfeeding. Johnny started researching oxytocin and quickly became obsessed with it. He read everything he could find on the topic and even started conducting his own experiments. He injected himself with oxytocin and observed the effects it had on his body and mind. 
He found that oxytocin made him feel more connected to others and increased his sense of well-being. Kiani's research on oxytocin led him to some interesting conclusions. He believes that oxytocin is the key to creating lasting relationships. He believes that it is the reason why people fall in love and stay in love. He also believes that it can help people to overcome their fears and anxieties. Johnny is now on a mission to spread the word about oxytocin and its amazing effects. He wants to help people to understand the power of this hormone and how it can change their lives. He is confident that oxytocin will one day be used to treat a variety of mental and physical health conditions. We are actually lucky enough to have Johnny here with us today. Welcome, Johnny. Hi, Johnny. I'm going to ask you some questions about oxytocin, the so-called love hormone. Yeah, sure. What do you want to know? Well, first of all, what is oxytocin? Oxytocin is a hormone that's produced by the pituitary gland. It's sometimes called the love hormone because it's involved in social bonding, sexual reproduction, and maternal behaviors. What does oxytocin do? Oxytocin has a lot of different effects. Why do people keep asking me that? It's involved in social bonding, sexual reproduction, and maternal behaviors. It's also been shown to reduce stress and anxiety, and increase trust and cooperation. How is oxytocin produced? Oxytocin is produced by the pituitary gland. I said so already, remember. It's released into the bloodstream, and then it travels to the brain where it has its effects. What are some of the things that can trigger oxytocin release? Oxytocin release can be triggered by social interactions, like hugging. It can also be released during childbirth, and it's thought to play a role in bonding between mothers and their infants. What are some of the effects of oxytocin? Oxytocin has a lot of different effects. It's involved in social bonding and maternal behaviors. It's also been shown to reduce stress and anxiety and increase trust and cooperation. Do we know why oxytocin is so important for social bonding? We don't know for sure, but it's thought to be because oxytocin is involved in trust, communication, and empathy. It's also possible that oxytocin helps to cement relationships by increasing positive emotions and reducing negative emotions. What else do we know about oxytocin? Oxytocin is also being studied for its potential role in treating various health conditions, such as autism, social anxiety, and post-traumatic stress disorder. That's fascinating. Thank you so much for your time, Johnny. Happy to be here. Can I go now? Yes. It's no secret that hugs are important to me. 
I'm a big fan of physical touch, and there's nothing quite like a good hug to make me feel loved and appreciated. I know some people might not be as big on hugs as I am, but that's okay. To each their own. What's important to me is that I make sure to hug the people in my life who mean the most to me. My family, my friends, my partner. These are the people who I want to feel my love and who I know will appreciate a good hug just as much as I do. I know that some people might view hugs as a simple act of affection, but to me, they mean so much more. They're a way of showing someone that you care about them, that you're thinking about them. They're a way of saying I'm here for you without having to say a single word. In a world that can be so cold and harsh, I believe that hugs are one of the most important things we can give to each other. They remind us that we're not alone, that we're loved and cherished. And that, to me, is the most important thing of all. I used to hate hugs. I would squirm and squeal and try to push my way out of them. I didn't like the way they made me feel, all trapped and helpless. I much preferred being on my own, where I could do what I wanted, when I wanted. But then I met Bobby. Bobby was a cat who loved hugs. He would come up to me and purr and rub his head against me, and he would wrap his arms around me and give me a big squeeze. At first, I tried to push him away. I didn't want his hugs. But he was persistent, and slowly but surely, I started to enjoy his hugs. I started to feel safe and loved when he was hugging me, and I even started to return his hugs. Now, I can't imagine life without Bobby's hugs. They've helped me to open up and to feel more connected to the world. I'm grateful to him for that, and I hope that we can continue to share hugs for many years to come. There are many things in life that can be considered random. From the weather patterns we experience to the people we meet, everything in life is subject to change without notice or predictability. This can be frustrating at times, but it is also what makes life so interesting. Without randomness, life would be quite boring. One of the most random things in life is the order in which we meet people. We could meet our best friend on the first day of school, or we could meet them at the grocery store years later. We could meet our future spouse at a bar, or we could meet them at church. The possibilities are endless, and ultimately, it is up to chance as to who we will meet and when. This randomness can be applied to any number of things in life. The job we get, the car we drive, the house we live in. All of these things are subject to change without notice or predictability. This is what makes life so interesting and, sometimes, so difficult. We never know what is going to happen next and, as such, we have to be prepared for anything. 
While randomness can be frustrating, it is also what makes life so exciting. We never know what is going to happen next and that is what keeps us on our toes. So, the next time you are feeling frustrated by the randomness of life, remember that it is this very randomness that makes life worth living. There are an endless amount of materials that exist in the world, each with their own unique properties and uses. Aluminum is a silvery white, soft, lightweight metal that is used in a wide variety of applications. It is resistant to corrosion and is a good conductor of electricity and heat. Aluminum is found in abundance in the Earth's crust and is the most widely used non-ferrous metal. Applications for aluminum include transportation, packaging, construction, and consumer products. Aluminum has a number of desirable properties that make it an ideal material for many applications. It is lightweight yet strong, making it ideal for use in transportation applications. It is also resistant to corrosion, so it can be used in packaging applications where food and beverages will be stored. Additionally, aluminum is a good conductor of electricity and heat, so it is often used in electrical applications. There are two main types of aluminum. Cast aluminum and wrought aluminum. Cast aluminum is made by pouring molten aluminum into a mold, where it solidifies. Wrought aluminum is made by rolling, extruding, or drawing aluminum into the desired shape. Aluminum is a versatile material that can be used in a wide variety of applications. It's lightweight. Strength and resistance to corrosion make it an ideal choice for transportation, packaging, and construction applications. Additionally, its good conductivity of electricity and heat make it a suitable choice for electrical applications. Have you heard about Carl and his house made out of aluminum? It was always his dream to build his own house. And not just any house, but a house made entirely out of aluminum. He had seen it in a movie once and it just seemed so cool. Plus, he was always a bit of a tinkerer and loved working with metal. So, when he finally had the money, and the time, he set to work building his dream home. It took him a few years, but he eventually finished it. And it was exactly how he wanted it. Every single thing in the house was made out of aluminum, from the walls to the furniture, even the appliances. It was like living in a giant aluminum can. But he loved it. It was his dream come true. Of course, there were some drawbacks. The house was extremely difficult to keep clean. And it got incredibly hot in the summer. but he didn't care. He was living in his dream home and that was all that mattered. The man had always been fascinated by aluminum. He loved the way it looked and the way it felt. When he was younger, 
He had even toyed with the idea of building his own house out of aluminum. But he never thought it would actually be possible. But then, one day, he won the lottery. And with that money, he was finally able to make his dream a reality. He bought a piece of land and hired the best architects and engineers he could find. And together, they created a house made entirely out of aluminum. The man was so happy. He had always wanted a house that was completely unique. And now he had it. It was his very own aluminum palace. Alan was always obsessed with aluminium. He loved the way it looked, the way it felt, and the way it sounded. He would often spend hours just staring at it, admiring its beauty. One day, he met a woman called Sarah, and he instantly fell in love with her. She was everything he had ever wanted in a partner, and he was determined to make her his. However, Sarah was not interested in aluminium in the slightest. In fact, she found it quite off-putting. Alan tried his best to hide his obsession, but eventually it became too much for him and he had to confess. Sarah was understanding, and she didn't mind that Alan was obsessed with aluminium. In fact, she found it quite endearing. The two of them soon started dating, and they were very happy together. However, Alan's obsession with aluminium began to take over his life. He would spend all of his time thinking about it, and he even started neglecting Sarah. She tried her best to support him, but eventually she realized that it was too much. Alan was heartbroken when Sarah left him, but he knew that it was for the best. He knew that he needed to get help for his obsession, and he vowed to change his ways. With the help of therapy, Alan was eventually able to overcome his obsession with aluminium. He was able to start living a normal life again, and he even started dating Sarah once more. They say that true love never fails, and in this case, it certainly didn't. Alan and Sarah were able to overcome the odds and find their way back to each other. That story always warms my heart. Even though it is quite weird that I have met two people obsessed with aluminum. I mean, isn't there more interesting materials out there? Like gold, or maybe iron. Speaking of iron, did you hear the story about the Iron Queen? The Iron Queen was a kind and gentle ruler who cared deeply for her people. She was a just and fair ruler, who always tried to do what was best for her kingdom. She was a wise ruler, who made decisions based on what she thought was right, not on what was popular. And she was a brave ruler, who was not afraid to stand up for what she believed in, even when it meant going against the grain. The Iron Queen was a firm but fair ruler. 
She believed in justice and equality, and she worked hard to ensure that her people were treated fairly. She was always willing to listen to her people, and she was quick to act when she felt that someone was being treated unfairly. She was also quick to forgive, and she was known for her mercy. The Iron Queen was a wise ruler. She was not afraid to make tough decisions, and she always put the needs of her kingdom first. She was known for her level head and her calm demeanor, even in the face of danger. She was also known for her intelligence, and she was able to outwit her enemies on many occasions. The Iron Queen was a brave ruler. She was not afraid to stand up for what she believed in, even when it meant going against the grain. She was known for her courage, and she was often the first to volunteer for dangerous missions. She was also known for her passion, and she was always fighting for what she believed in. The Iron Queen was a kind, gentle, just, and fair ruler who always tried to do what was best for her kingdom. She was a wise and intelligent ruler who made decisions based on what she thought was right, not on what was popular. And she was a brave and courageous ruler who was not afraid to stand up for what she believed in, even when it meant going against the grain. One day, however, her kingdom was threatened by a giant turtle that had appeared from the sea. The turtle was so large that it completely blocked the entrance to the kingdom, and no one could enter or leave. The queen knew that she had to do something to save her kingdom, so she ordered her finest blacksmiths to forge a great iron suit of armor for her. Once she was clad in the armor, she rode out to meet the turtle. The queen and the turtle fought a great battle, but in the end, the queen emerged victorious. She slew the turtle with a single blow and saved her kingdom. The people of the kingdom were so grateful to her that they proclaimed her the Iron Queen, and she ruled over them for many more years in peace and prosperity. However, when the story is flipped, it is different. Because if you were to ask the turtle, the story comes out differently. The giant turtle had to leave his home because of the Iron Queen. The queen was a cruel ruler who demanded that all the animals in the forest submit to her will. The giant turtle was a peaceful creature who just wanted to live in peace with the other animals. However, the queen would not allow this and she demanded that the giant turtle submit to her. When the giant turtle refused, the queen became angry and she ordered her soldiers to attack the giant turtle's home. The giant turtle was forced to flee and he eventually found a new home in a different forest. The giant turtle was sad to leave his home but he knew that it was necessary in order to stay safe. Turtles have always been fascinating to me. A giant sea turtle is a magnificent creature. These gentle giants can weigh up to 1,000 pounds and can live to be over 100 years old. Giant sea turtles are found in all of the world's oceans, except for the Arctic and Antarctic. They spend most of their time in the water, but they must come ashore to lay their eggs. 
There are seven species of giant sea turtle. The green turtle, the loggerhead, the hawksbill, the Kemp's ridley, the olive ridley, the flatback, and the leatherback. The green turtle is the largest of all the giant sea turtles. They can grow up to 5 feet long and can weigh up to 700 pounds. Green turtles are found in tropical and subtropical waters all over the world. The loggerhead turtle is the second largest of the giant sea turtles. They can grow up to 3 feet long and can weigh up to 400 pounds. Loggerhead turtles are found in the Atlantic, Pacific, and Mediterranean oceans. The hawksbill turtle is the third largest of the giant sea turtles. They can grow up to 2 feet long and can weigh up to 200 pounds. Hawksbill turtles are found in the Caribbean Sea, the Gulf of Mexico, and the Indian and Pacific Oceans. The Kemp's Ridley turtle is the fourth largest of the giant sea turtles. They can grow up to 2 feet long and can weigh up to 100 pounds. Kemp's Ridley turtles are found in the Gulf of Mexico and the Atlantic Ocean. The olive ridley turtle is the fifth largest of the giant sea turtles. They can grow up to 2 feet long and can weigh up to 90 pounds. Olive ridley turtles are found in the Pacific, Atlantic, and Indian Oceans. The flatback turtle is the sixth largest of the giant sea turtles. They can grow up to 2 feet long and can weigh up to 80 pounds. Flatback turtles are found in the Indian and Pacific Oceans. The leatherback turtle is the seventh and largest of the giant sea turtles. They can grow up to 6 feet long and can weigh up to 2,000 pounds. Leatherback turtles are found in the Pacific, Atlantic, and Indian Oceans. Giant sea turtles are gentle giants that play an important role in the ocean ecosystem. These amazing creatures are threatened by pollution, climate change, and hunting. We must do everything we can to protect them. Baby turtles are one of the most adorable and popular animals on the planet. People love their small size, their big eyes, and their gentle nature. Baby turtles are also a popular choice for people who are looking for a pet that is low maintenance and easy to care for. There are many different species of turtles and each one has its own unique set of care requirements. In this article, we are going to focus on baby turtles and what you need to know in order to take care of them. When it comes to baby turtles, there are a few things that you need to keep in mind. First of all, they are very delicate creatures. This means that you need to be extra careful when handling them. If you are not careful, you could easily hurt them. Baby turtles also have a very sensitive stomach. This means that you need to be careful about what you feed them. Some turtles can only eat certain types of food so it is important to do your research before you buy a turtle. 
Another thing to keep in mind is that baby turtles grow very quickly. This means that you need to be prepared for them to outgrow their home very quickly. If you are not prepared for this, you could end up with a very unhappy turtle. Make sure that you have a plan for where your turtle will go when it gets too big for its current home. Finally, baby turtles need a lot of love and attention. They are not like other pets that can be left alone for long periods of time. Baby turtles need to be held and played with on a regular basis. If you are not prepared to give your turtle the attention it needs, then you should not get one. Baby turtles are a lot of work, but they are also a lot of fun. If you are prepared to take on the responsibility of caring for a baby turtle, then you will be rewarded with a loyal and loving friend. As a teenager, you are going through so many changes. You are growing physically, emotionally, and mentally. It's a lot to deal with. And on top of all of that, you are also dealing with the stress of school, friends, and family. So it's no wonder that you might feel like you are all alone sometimes. But don't worry, there are plenty of other teenagers out there who feel just like you do. In fact, you might be surprised to learn that you have more in common with turtles than you might think. Just like you, turtles are going through lots of changes during their teenage years. They are growing and changing physically, emotionally, and mentally. They are also dealing with the stress of their environment, whether it be predators, changes in temperature, or lack of food. So turtles can definitely relate to what you are going through. One of the biggest changes that turtles go through during their teenage years is their shell. As they grow, their shell begins to harden and change shape. This can be a stressful time for turtles, as they are adjusting to their new shell and trying to protect themselves from predators. Similarly, you are also going through changes in your body. You are growing taller, your voice is changing, and you are going through puberty. Like turtles, this can be a stressful time for you as you are adjusting to your new body and trying to figure out who you are. Just like turtles need to be careful of predators, you also need to be careful of the people around you. There are people who will try to take advantage of you, so it's important to be aware of your surroundings and who you can trust. The teenage years can be tough, but just remember that you are not alone. There are plenty of other teenagers out there who are going through the same thing. And who knows, you might even have more in common with turtles than you thought. James is an old turtle who has lived a long and eventful life. He was born in the wild, in a time when turtles were much more common than they are now. He remembers a time when the world was a very different place and when turtles were an important part of the ecosystem. As a young turtle, James was very adventurous. He loved to explore his surroundings and learn about the world around him. 
He was always curious, and he loved to ask questions. He quickly became friends with all of the other animals in his area, and he soon learned a lot about the natural world. As James grew older, he began to see the effects of humans on the environment. He saw how they were polluting the air and the water and how they were destroying the habitats of many animals. He also saw how they were hunting turtles for their shells and how this was causing the population of turtles to decline. As James got even older, he became more and more concerned about the state of the world. He wanted to do something to help make the world a better place for turtles and for all animals. He began to speak out against the things that humans were doing to the environment, and he became an important voice for change. Today, James is one of the oldest turtles in the world. He is still active in the fight for animal rights and the protection of the environment. He is an inspiration to all who meet him, and he continues to make a difference in the world. Cease was always fascinated by the sea. As a child, she would spend hours lying on the beach, listening to the sound of the waves and dreaming of what it would be like to swim in them. When she was older, she would go on holiday to the seaside with her family and friends, but she never dared to venture into the water. She was content to paddle at the edge, watching as the others splashed and played in the waves. One day, Cease came across an article about the Dead Sea. The name alone was enough to send a shiver down her spine, but she was curious to learn more. She read about how the sea got its name and how its waters are so salty that no creatures can live in them. She was fascinated by the idea of a place where life could not exist. She decides to visit the Dead Sea. She is not sure what to expect, but she is determined to find out more about this strange place. When she arrives, she is surprised to see how beautiful it is. The water is a deep blue, and the sun is shining. She takes a deep breath and plunges into the water. At first, the salt stings her skin, but she soon gets used to it. She floats effortlessly in the water, and she can feel the tension melting away from her body. She spends hours swimming and exploring the sea, and she is amazed by how different it is to any other body of water she has ever seen. When Cease emerges from the water, she feels refreshed and invigorated. She has never felt so alive before. She knows that she has found her true passion in life, and she is determined to change the name of the Dead Sea to something with a more positive tone. Cease was always a go-getter, never content to sit idle and let life pass her by. When she was just a young girl, she would often dream of making a difference in the world. of being somebody who left a lasting impression on those around her. And so, after finishing school, she set out to make her dreams a reality. She started her own business and quickly made a name for herself as a successful entrepreneur. But Cease didn't stop there. 
she was always looking for ways to give back, and so she decided to use her business skills to help others. She started a charity which helped to fund education for disadvantaged children. However, Cece's true passion was always in environmentalism. She had always been fascinated by the natural world and was determined to do whatever she could to protect it. And so, when she heard about the plight of the Dead Sea, she knew that she had to do something. The Dead Sea is one of the most important ecosystems in the world, and yet it is slowly dying due to the pollution and overuse of its resources. Cease is determined to change this. She is working tirelessly to raise awareness of the issue and to lobby for change. She is also working on a plan to create a sustainable future for the Dead Sea, one that will protect its ecosystem for generations to come. Cease is an inspiring woman who is making a real difference in the world. She is proof that one person can make a difference and that we all have the power to change the world for the better. Cease loves the Dead Sea, but her friend Stefan hates it. Stefan has a fear of salt. It all started when he was a child and he accidentally ate some salt. Since then, he has been scared of salt and has avoided it at all costs. He won't even go near the ocean because he is afraid of the salt water. This fear has led to Stefan having a very limited diet. He only eats foods that are salt-free, and he has to be careful about what he eats when he is out at restaurants. This can be very hard to do, especially since many foods contain hidden sources of salt. Stefan's fear of salt has also led to him having social anxiety. He is afraid to meet new people because he doesn't want them to know about his fear. This has made him very isolated and he has trouble making friends. Salt is everywhere and it is hard to avoid. Stefan has to be careful about everything he eats and touches. Even something like sweat can contain salt and trigger his fear. Living with this fear can be very difficult, but Stefan has found ways to cope. He has a support system of friends and family who understand his fear and help him to avoid situations that might trigger it. He also tries to stay positive and remind himself that his fear is not a death sentence. Although it is not always easy, Stefan is managing to live with his fear of salt. Stefan has always been afraid of salt. It's not that he's afraid of the ocean or swimming in it, he's just afraid of salt. He's never been able to explain it, but something about the way it feels on his skin or the way it tastes makes him feel uncomfortable. This fear has always made him a bit of an outsider, as most people love the ocean and salt. Cease, on the other hand, loves the ocean and salt. She loves the way it smells and the way it feels on her skin. She's always been fascinated by the ocean and the creatures that live in it. One day, Stefan and Cease meet by chance. 
they strike up a conversation and quickly become friends. Stefan confides in Cease about his fear of salt and Cease listens sympathetically. She doesn't judge him or try to change his mind. She just accepts him for who he is. Over time, she starts to share her love of the ocean with Stefan. She takes him to the beach and shows him how to build sandcastles. She teaches him how to swim and even takes him to the Dead Sea. Stefan is amazed by how salty it is and how he can't sink. He starts to see the beauty in the ocean and the salt that he once feared. Without even realizing it, Cease has helped Stefan overcome his fear. He's now able to enjoy the ocean and the salt that he once feared. They remain friends for many years and Cease continues to help Stefan grow and overcome his fears.